Okay, I believe this is part four <coughs> of uh, chapter 15, Environmental Dispute Resolution. And uh, we're just going to do a couple of slides here because this is, this is, there's a lot built into this particular one. This is called Fair Division. And here is uh, figure 15.2 from the, from the book. And Fair Division resembles the cutting of a cake in terms of uh, natural resources and capital. And there are various different methods to uh, cut this cake. And your book goes into quite a bit of detail on each of these methods. So I'll just go over these uh, hopefully rather quickly. Our first one is divide and choose. And that's not shown in the, in the picture here. Um, equal division is the goal, and adverse parties have similar uh, preferences. So uh, the divide and choose um, allows one party to divide the resource into two parts and the other to choose between the two allotments. So in this case, the divider has the incentive to divide the, the um, and divide equally to maximize the value of the inferior, if not equal part that will remain. Uh, after the chooser makes a selection. So, so one party has a choice over the division and the other party has a, has a choice over choose. So they're both kept in check because they, they know they're going to get something from, uh, from the deal. Um, now again, this, this is good if, um, if it's equal division, but some conflicts are not so simple. The equitable appeal of divide and choose diminishes when the preferences of the parties differ. Um, your book talks about the uh, conflict between the Nature Conservancy and the American Petroleum Institute, um, and they're trying to divide the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Um, but the uh, but the value that is placed may be uh, uh, may be different. It may be the same amount of land, but the but the values would would um, would certainly and could certainly differ. Now another method is called say stop and in this one it divides uniform but hard to measure assets among parties wishing to maximize their shares and this uh, this is um, easier to administer than divide and choose. Now your your book talks about um, environmentalists, Australian fishers and international fishers want to divide the cuttlefish habitat into three equally desirable areas and the solution would be to have a boat travel the length of the reef where the cuttlefish are and a representative from each of the three parties will call out stop at any one time and the caller's share will be the stretch of stretch the boat has already passed so each party each party says where they're where they 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 want and they would have access uh, to that area now, it cannot assure an equitable outcome when a dividing a heterogeneous resource uh, between parties with differing tastes. Um, that, that, can be, uh, that can certainly be, uh, be an issue, but when it's homogeneous, say stop could be an easy to apply methodology. Okay, now we have um, strict alternation and a couple with balanced alternation. And a strict alternation, these would be assets that are heterogeneous. <clears throat> they sometimes can be divided fairly by taking turns. Um, this works particularly well when there's not an odd number of items with particularly high or low value, and the party's knowledge of each other's preferences cannot lead to an unfair advantage. So our first row here, we have two countries, and this is described in your book, Guyana and Venezuela. And um, we are talking about their dispute over the environmentally rich region of the Essequibo River. And <clears throat> the first situation we have a we have taking turns. And if the islands in question, and uh, let's see, um, we suppose that Venezuela and Guyana, and by the way, these are in uh, um, South America, would like to control as many islands as possible and that they each favor control over the larger islands. If the islands in question are similar in size and location and even in number, 
strict alternation can yield a fair resolution. So in the first case, Guiana would, would choose the first um, would choose the first island. Let's say we have two large and two small. And then um, Venezuela would choose um, uh, would, would choose the um, actually it would be Guiana first and then and then Venezuela. And then um, Venezuela would be the second chooser, and it would choose um, the the second, the first, the second uh, large island, and um, and get the um, and, and get the small. Okay, yeah. So uh, so right. So Ven so Guiana would let me repeat that. Guiana would be the first. And they would get the first large island. And Venezuela would be the second. They would get the second large island, and then Guiana would get the small in the second round, small, and then Venezuela small. So in that way, we have an equal distribution. Now, in the second case, uh, we have strict alternations, um, same preferences. Now we have three large islands and one small. Um, <clears throat> if instead there are three large islands and one small. The first church chooser would gain the advantage. They would they would choose the first large island. The second chooser would choose the second large island, and then the um, and then Guiana would get the third large island, and Venezuela would get the small island. So now Ven now Guiana has an unfair advantage if you if we're strictly taking turns. Okay, now to examine the role of known preferences, imagine there is one small, one medium size, and one large unpopulated island, and one large and one large island populated by the citizens of Guiana. Now Guiana would be the first chooser and it prefers large islands. It would choose the island with Guianese on it. So that is our third row here. Venezuela would choose the other large island and then Guiana would get the medium and Venezuela would get the, would get the small. Um, so this provides each island, each country would prefer with control over its um, most favored island um, plus either a small or a medium island the first chooser has a slight advantage. Okay so this is where the preferences um, are um, are unknown. Um, now Guiana knows Venezuela's preferences. This is our fourth row. Guiana will begin by selecting the large unpopulated island. Oh, and then Venezuela will choose the, the medium island because as Guiana knows, this takes preference over the larger island populated by Guianese. Um, now now Guiana gets the large island with populated by Guianese and Venezuela gets the small island. Um, so it looks like Guiana would get the would get the advantage. So that leads to something called balanced alternation. In this case, the inequities of strict alternation can be resolved by taking turns and taking turns. <laughs> That is, in the island choosing example, rather than selecting the order Guiana, Venezuela, Guiana, Venezuela, Guiana could choose first in the, in the first round. Venezuela can choose first in the second round, making the order Guiana, Venezuela, Venezuela, um, Guiana. And this would prevent Guiana from garnering both of the large islands, but it does not guarantee the most equitable solution. So here we have balance our alternation. Guiana gets the first, um, <clears throat> gets the populated island, then Venezuela, um, and then it would be um, Venezuela would get the would get the small island, but and but get it, Venezuela knows that it would be the first chooser in the second round. It would get the it would get the large island with Guiana getting the medium size. So that balances out the inequities a little bit when you take turns at taking turns. Finally, we have the adjusted winner method. It can provide balanced allocation of resources in some cases where alternation cannot. And, um, and your book uses the example of Greece and Turkey over fish stocks in their contested territorial waters. Um, the application of the adjusted winner method would have each country assign 100 points 
among the three assets as weights to represent the country's preferences. And then you can read on about how that would, um, how that would um, work itself out. There is an incentive for the parties to under, understate the extent to which they favor assets as long as they do not control, lose control over the assets. So there can, there's certainly going to be some strategic behavior in, in this case as well. Actually, in all of these cases, there's going to be strategic behavior between the two um, countries. Okay, and then agreement. There can be much to agree upon. Um, you can have an agreed upon, you, you can have um, an award, but the question in this, in this section is how you're going to divide up that, that award, um, the bargaining rent as it were. Okay, our next and final, sl final stay, um, slide in this section, Hawaii and North Shore Development. I see a lot of signs about this. This is with respect to Turtle Bay and the idea that there's too much development going on up in the North Shore, especially with respect to Turtle Bay and how it impacts uh, traffic especially. So dispute, disputes over development are common and on Oahu, especially on the North Shore because of impact on the environment and especially with North Shore residents' impact upon traffic. Now, the divide and choose method uh, uh, diminishes when the preferences of the two parties differ. So hotel developers versus residents. So one can, one can divide up the, um, the land, as it were, but for residents, a big, big issue is going to be, um, is going to be traffic, no matter how well you divide up the land itself. There's only going to be so much uh, road that is going to be up there. And Kamehameha Highway is a still a two-lane road and there's still going to be a tremendous amount of traffic no matter how you divide and how you choose. Okay, and this ends our, um, our section here.